If it's ours, welcome again. I think it's again. I'm pretty sure you've been on this one before, but to Property Insights. I must be doing something right. Yeah, you've been on a few of my shows. Either I, that or I someone cancelled on you at I the last I get confused. Minute. Not at all, not at all. And you brought me in. I need to know if you first, yeah. first start. What, what are your gigs now? Because, like, it was, I keep bumping into you into the makeup department in um, Cell 9, which is a bit embarrassing from my point of view. Some of us lead a little more makeup than yeah, others, Mark. Exactly. We won't um, say and, who. Uh, so, uh, that's, uh, but, and so I know you're still at 9 yeah. as a commentator there. Uh, yeah. What are you doing? What's Invest Smart and who owns it, who runs it? What's the deal there? Yeah. Look, I'm fortunate enough to, to wear a couple of hats. A- and for me, that is exactly where I want to be. It enables me to really get a good sense of the overall market. And for my role that I'm so passionate about financial literacy, it's great to get that broad spectrum. So I still work for CanStar, so I'm their ambassador. Love their data. I like looking at CanStar da- being what to, to the a comparison site. Yep. Sorry, yeah, CanStar is a comparison site. They're Australia's largest comparison site. So they get a lot of traffic coming through their website as to what are they clicking on, what are people wanting to save. How do they compare? So that data for me is great because it gives me great insights as to how Aussies can save on their everyday household bills. Now, InvestSmart is a robo-advising platform. So that's headed up by Ron Hodge. Uh, Paul Clithrow is the, the chairman. Um, and for me, I actually sat on the board, um, sat on the board for a couple of years, loved it, loved it. Great minds, looking at funds under management, what's happening with investment and so on and how the business runs. Um, I then decided to kind of jump ship and go on the other side of the business and it's a real eye opener because I guess what you see as someone sitting on a board role is very different once you actually get into the mechanics of a business. And the reason I wanted to do that is that I am passionate about financial literacy. I'm also passionate about building wealth. There's only so much you can do as far as, you know, uh, watching the sense. And that's very important. Don't get me wrong. In terms you know, of saving money. Saving. Yeah. The, the number one rule I was always taught by Paul himself was save little, saved often. So I'm not dismissing that. But the past several years, Mark, we have really been chasing every dollar trying to find savings and rightly so, that we have really lost sight of the bigger picture and that is building wealth. And now even consumer sentiment um, uh, numbers came out today by Westpac. We're starting to feel a little bit better. I'm not saying we're behind everything, but we have sacrificed a lot over the past couple of years at a big cost as well. Um, And for me, it was all about making sense and building wealth, you know, bringing back investments and making it easier for for people to actually do that. Why should the investment world be only be kept for the rich? Why can't we all understand how to make the most of our money? So so that's essentially why I was passionate about jumping into the business. So for people who can't afford financial advice, and let's face it, you need about $5,000 to to, to see a financial advisor. Um, This is one way where you can go in get a statement of advice, see your risk profile and potentially get some type of portfolio that may suit your risk profile with a whole lot of different exchange traded funds. And put simply, they basically track an index. They're not a bank account. So there are risks. Of course, there are risks with these products. But in the long term, it's an easy way for people like me and and everyday Aussies to actually build wealth in the long term. So So, I want to talk about building wealth. So yeah. When you say building wealth, yeah. as you said, um, save little and save often, yeah. which is Paul Clitheroe's um, uh, mantra. Yeah, um, th- you're right. You can you can't build the difference between what you earn and what you spend unless you can somehow increase what you earn rapidly. Yeah. And that's usually a pretty hard thing to do for most yeah. Australians. But you can influence by what you spend, so you can build wealth that way. Yeah, and that is, but it's only incremental. It's mm. like small amounts, small amounts. But over time, it works. I think what you mean by building wealth on the other side of it is what you invest in, Mm -hmm. what you Mm -hmm. invest in. Is that what Mm -hmm. we're talking about? And how you invest. And most people need advice and they can't go and see a planner because you sit in front of a financial planner these days after the Royal Commission inquiry, you've got to to pay the dude or the girl uh, $5,000, minimum $5,000 just to sit in front of them sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, So 
Investmart is is robo advice. Robo advice. Uh, what does that mean? And uh, like, because most people don't even know what they think a robo cop was. Robo advice <laughs> mean it's electronic advice, but yeah, yeah. It, it's basically you could look at it as like limited advice. So you put in a number of, of answers to questions. So it questions you. It questions so you. So go and log on. It, exactly. You log on. What are you saving for? I'm saving for a holiday. I'm saving for a car. I'm saving for a deposit. Yeah. It, interesting to note the number one reason why people actually did a statement of advice was for an emergency. So they're looking at just setting up some kind of emergency fund. Then it was building wealth and then it was to save for property. So everyone has different goals. You, you punch in what your goal would be. But it asks you the question. Yeah. It asks you the question. So it asks you a number of questions and then out pops out what could be a, a recommended portfolio for you based on your risk profile. So I, I'm not going to put you on the spot because it's yeah. a difficult one, but by way of example, let's say I'm, you know, 25 years of age yeah. and I say I'm saving for a deposit. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the system, I presume there's some AI in there. Yes. But, there, there, but there's some sort of machine learning that sort of says, well, based on Mark's age, his job, his dependencies in terms of a dependence, I might not have any, I might have a dependence depending, um, and uh, his income and his expenses, um, this is how Mark should save. Yes. Is it like that? Yeah, expenses not so much going into it. So it's more what's your time frame, what are you saving for? So you said 25 but yet you want to buy a deposit. So is that deposit in under five years? Is it over five years? All that yes, ask makes more a questions. difference. Yeah, all that does make a difference. Have you got time on your side or do you not have time on your side? Okay, so I want to, build, yeah. I want to get a deposit in the next three years because I, I don't want to miss the next yeah. increased yeah. cycle, property yeah. cycle, which we can talk about a bit later. Yeah. Um, and I want to and probably is going to ask me the next question. You know, how much deposit do you need? Yes, yes. Um, so you'd need ten thousand with Investmart, but there are plenty of other robo advisors that you could get in for less as well. Um, but something like that, three years is not a long time no, frame. I know. It's not a long time. So frame. automatically so, says I, I'm, I need to take risk. Yeah. Well, so then if you don't have that time frame, then you don't need this. Yeah. You, if you are wanting your money in one year's time or two years time, maybe an online saver is just yeah. as good what you need. And let's face it, right now with the, the, the uh, interest rate sitting at five or six, you know, the share market is competing with, with something that's a guaranteed income from a bank account. But that's not always going to be the case. We've heard from the RBA, um, the governor, basically she is not alluding that we're going to have rate cuts, but, you know, you, you speak to a lot of economists and they're saying possibly, some are saying three this year. Money markets are definitely baking it in. Yeah. So if you see interest rates come down, then that means we've reached the peak of that interest rate cycle and then unfortunately your, your, your cash accounts aren't going to be paying as high and this is this happens th things go in cycles so it's a case then well where can I get more bang for my buck that's not to say you shouldn't have a cash account absolutely but look diversify and look at your options and if interest rates do fall down then the share market starts looking a lot more attractive so does, is this what the investment then tells you like um, does it sort of have a prediction in there it's some somewhere um, you know built into the modeling the, its own modeling that um, Perhaps interest rates will come off, and if I want to save, you know, fifty thousand um, dollars, starting off with twenty grand, I want to save fifty thousand dollars, and I can bank ten thousand dollars a quarter, or whatever. Oh, no, that's a bad, bad example. Yeah. ten thousand dollars a year. But does it um, um, say to me, well, given interest rates are probably going to come off, maybe Mark, you should be buying this dividend yielding chair? Well, not that specific. It doesn't no, get to that level. No, it's basically if your your time frame, your risk profile, maybe you're just looking at, say, a, a portfolio that's basically cash or fixed interest because that's what your time frame or your risk profile uh, allows you to. But there's a whole process of getting to that stage. For me, it's always about content, information, getting educated first, knowing your options, then doing something like that, then making a decision. Because if you've only got five or ten thousand dollars to investing then you know paying five thousand to get that advice just does not no, make sense no, totally. um, and it's a case of really understanding what asset classes you do have out there and for most Aussies we don't have the time nor do we want to be picking stocks and having a look and seeing which one should we going in which one, which ones should we not far easier to track the index so maybe you just want something the index. yeah so you're looking at say a portfolio that tracks the ASX 200 yep. the 200 biggest stocks it's a low cost way you got diversification it seems like a no-brainer and it's something to sit alongside with your other kind of um, uh, accounts that you may have yeah, yeah I get it okay and and then is there 
any educational stuff on on the investment program? Oh, absolutely. So, so basic, is that what you were doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The education side is definitely where um, you know it's my baby. So from us, you know, we have a, a regular newsletter that comes out. So Paul will feature in that. I'll feature in that. Some of the best kind of experts with investing as well, making it really simple and also money matters as well. So the most important thing for me is that you do get educated and you can make those decisions for yourself. Yeah, the same yeah. because most wealth wealthy people. Talk to other wealthy people, yeah, and they all have, all have access to sort of what is like secrets in the market. Not really secrets, but they're just access to information in the market, which, generally speaking, the you know the normal person doesn't find out about until the AFR starts writing about it. Or you know, and then like usually that. it's a little bit late. I, and I think usually, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it is. Or yeah. and it's got to be talked about two or three times before because you might not buy the paper that yeah. day or yeah. whatever. And you've got to, it's got to be get talked about it quite a few times before you're on. And by that stage, everyone else is already set. All the all the smarties are already set. So, is the objective of um, your new gig, Smart Invest, is yep. it about updating people at a timely level, like <laughs> making sure that I find out. I can find out what I need to know in order to make decisions at the same time as other people make Yeah, spot on. Because it has a whole range of ETFs, basically putting some spotlight on those as well. But also going back to the basics, for those those of us who have never invested, why should you? What are the risks? What are the pros? Looking at super as well, looking at even just saving on everyday money. So it takes you through, through a journey. But it is definitely about educating you and also alerting you if interest rates do go down, what does that mean? What does that mean for your investments? Um, what does that mean for, for, for anything? Uh, so, yeah, throwing in news in a practical way so people can actually act on it. Now, I, my favourite, one of my favourite topics, certainly our audience's favourite topic is the property market. Yeah, thing. yeah. And uh, so, and property is an asset class that you're, yeah. you're very familiar with and uh, advise on and talk about all the time as a mm. commentator. Um, what, is, what is your prognosis around, and I, I guess we can only talk about a national property price number yeah. because there's no point in me saying in particular anywhere in particular. I'm not going to you know, pin you to, the, to Darlinghurst or, you know, some part of Sydney, Redfern or something. But what is your general prognosis around property prices given that in Australia, and particularly here in Sydney, but Australia – Property prices clawed back. The property market clawed back the losses that it got first experienced when interest rates started to advise, uh, 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 rise. Um, and then, notwithstanding the thirteen rate rises, um, the property market is actually in most uh, p- uh, places in Australia, apart from Melbourne and Darwin and Hobart have recovered and some yeah, what yeah. they lost. And you look at the um, the clearance rates, recent clearance rates as well, and they're so strong. They're so strong. There seems to be no stopping the, the property market. Well, what and is that about? Why? Why? Because, you know, interest <laughs> rates are quite high now, relatively speaking. How, what's interest driving rates, this? yeah, definitely. We've had 13 rate hikes. Um, we've seen repayments go up like, you know, 1,500. We've seen people. A month. Uh, a mu- a, a, yeah, a month. A month. With, no, no, with it's a lot people. of money. Yeah, it's a month. It's interesting now that because there is some light at the end of the tunnel and there's a lot of behavioural economics that comes into property as well. So you, 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 you think about the fact that, oh, if rates do come down, then prices are just going to escalate. I've got to go out and go, I've got to get this property at all costs. Farmer. Yeah, exactly. And I'm seeing that. I have a 24-year-old that's looking at buying is her first place. This is my daughter. So she's done all the right things. She's saved little, saved often. She opened up a, a, an ETF, young age, done that, taking advantage of basically the government's home guarantee scheme, 5% deposit, no stamp duty where she is in Canberra. But can she find a place that she can afford? This is the thing. First and foremost, it's got to be a unit. There's no way she can afford a a house. There's actually right now, I was looking at latest data, about a 45% gap between houses versus units. So this is looking at CoreLogic's data. That's a huge gap. Now, before the pandemic, equivalent though, like two, like a two-bedroom house versus no, a two-bedroom house. No, that's all house. dwellings. So we're just talking about dwellings, all not dwellings. a Yeah, just oh, yeah. generally top yep. level stuff. Yep. Before the pandemic, that gap was only about sixteen percent, Mark. Wow. I know, it was quite tight. But because the pandemic happened, then people wanted more space. You know the story. We all, we all wanted no to have No one lived in a unit. They want to live in a house. Exactly. Better get in the backyard. Exactly. And then interest rates went up and then affordability, so that pushed houses a little bit more. So you would think that units would be a logical way for first-time buyers to get into. Now, I'm talking generally because you can find areas, of course, you can to jump in. But even on the average salary, when you look at the average salary and repayments because of where interest rates are, 
there are only two places, you know, I think it was Perth and Darwin were the only two areas where someone on their own could buy a place if they're on an average income. A house. A, a unit. A unit. Yeah, we're not talking houses. Wow. So. It is so expensive for young people to jump in there. But I, I'm, I'm more optimistic than pessimistic. So you hear a lot of news you, and, 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 you know, I'm in the media, maybe I'm to blame sometimes as well, that affordability is gone out, no one can afford to buy. That's not entirely true. And it, 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 you, a lot of first-time buyers do lose hope in jumping into the property market. It's just a case, what are you willing to sacrifice? Where are you willing to buy? And do you jump in as an owner or investor? So so is that a reason then why places like um, Orange and Dubbo and um, other regional areas are doing well, so investors are going into those markets? Because there's high demand for rentals in those places, particularly places like Orange where there's a big mining company, et cetera, and yeah. there's lots of people in and out of the joint and not enough new development for people to live in. So if... I don't want to invest in Perth. I'm your daughter. I don't want to invest in Perth mm-hmm. and I don't want to invest in Darwin because mm. Darwin's a bit weird. I mean, <laughs> gracious me, Darwin, I love the place, but I mean, it's just a bit unusual place. Perth's different. Um, it's got a bit of, a lot better infrastructure, but it's just too far away. Yeah. I, I, just, I just can't sort of fathom it. Um, and, I, and therefore, I, every, other, every other metro is too expensive for me. Am I – should I, 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 start, I want to get into the investment market. I'm, I, there's no point in me sitting here waiting for it to come back to my mm-hmm, price mm-hmm. Um, because that's risky because you might miss it forever. Um, should I be investing in regional areas? Well, it all comes down to obviously if you're going to be investing in regional areas, are you going to be living in there? Are you going to be doing no, it? No, I'm not going to live there. I'm just going to rent there. it. So, but I'm uh, in the market. Yeah, it depends on where. We, we talk so generally. So in a lot of cases during COVID, you had unbelievable yields coming from regional areas. Some of that has pulled back and some of it is definitely still there. I think the biggest problem with a lot of young buyers, and, and it made news a little bit um, uh, as well, if you're not getting stamp duty concessions, stamp duty is a big, a big obstacle even to get in whether it's regional or outside. And the other thing is you think about a lot of young people, have they finished uni or some kind of higher education, they've got their HEX help debt, um, uh, strata fees on, on units are crazy. Strata fees, like a $5,000 strata fee, reduces your borrowing power by almost 50000 Yeah. So, so a young person has to weigh up, I've got a HEX debt, I'm looking at a unit so I've got strata fees, I've also got a personal loan on my car, Already, your borrowing power is reduced by one hundred and fifty thousand. So there are a lots of obstacles for young buyers, whether they're going in a regional area and rent vesting, or whether they're buying outright and going to live in it. And of course, um, the stamp the stamp duty um, concessions only apply yeah. if you got to live there too. So like, you got to be very careful with these things. What are your thoughts with the whole stamp duty? You mean the recent stamp duty, um, Chris, it, New South Wales ones, the Christmas? Well, the, yes, there was that. That was for first home buyers yep. to kind of um, do it like a land tax. Up to but now there's a whole debate that you know they need to go completely. Uh, they've gone six or seven times what they were ten years ago. Obviously, because prices, prices are prob- go up. yeah, prices go up, yeah. and it, it's a, a percentage of the property value, and, and that is a great barrier, and that's stopping people from downsizing. Well, it's definitely a ba- barrier for first home uh, first home buyers, but um, but a, when it comes to downsizing, as you said. It's a, bar- it's a barrier. Yep. It's a barrier. But if you're downsizing, generally speaking, you're going to have a lot left over from what you downsize from. But you're going to spend it on stamp duty again? Yeah, well, if you're going to spend all of it on stamp duty, yeah. you definitely wouldn't yeah. do that. Um, but if you're, you know, like if you've got something you bought for 500000 is now worth $3 million and you're going to buy something for a million, it maybe it sort of makes a bit yeah. of sense to downsize. Well, inflate prices. Do I th- but do, if you ask me, do I think stamp duty is a fair tax, I don't think it is. Yeah. But do I have another alternative to uh, fill the coffers of the New South Wales government or any state government for that <laughs> matter? Because can. I don't know what the alternative is. Um, it, you know, really, I, I think this is a big discussion between all governments, but maybe we're better off increasing the GST and yeah. giving more of the GST back to the states in terms of what they give up relative to stamp yeah. duty. So if, if all this... And I, I, if I wouldn't, probably wouldn't start a stamp duty, I'd probably start payroll tax. <clears throat> um, and I probably <laughs> would say, like, you know, like all these medical... Um, medical um, centres are now getting all, they're saying that all the doctors, um, employees, even though they're not employees, but we're going to deem them employees, and as a result of these big medical centres got this massive payroll tax bill uh, uh, ahead of them. And I think the payroll tax to me is uh, one of the most obvious taxes 
that exists that I'm getting taxed because I employ someone. Yeah. That yep. does not make any sense yep. to me. I don't know where it's come from. But I mean, a lot of it's got to do with where can state governments tax people because they have a constitutional um, barrier to taxing on income like they do in the states. Yeah. In the US, United States, states can tax for income as well. Um, but I'm sort of glad we don't do that here in Australia. But therefore, how are we going to fund the state? Um, well, maybe payroll tax is the first one to go and the second one would be stamp duty. The land tax, I don't have a real major problem with land tax if you've accumulated a lot of pro- – uh, it's sort of a wealth tax, but if you've mm. accumulated a lot of property, that's probably okay. Um, and it, with, with the exemptions, I think it has to be GST, but I've been banging on for a long time. So, uh, like, I, I just know, just say in the um, the Sydney Morning Herald, Ross Gittins wrote a, a column, as he always does every day, and Ross was talking about the um, the actual lack of intellect – in and around things like um, interest rate increases yeah. to control our spending behaviour, behaviours as a nation. And he did raise the possibility instead of um, from your salary, instead of from now on I increase the interest rates on your mortgage to stop you from spending money out there in the marketplace, I instead have across the board a new rule that for the sh- time being until it, spending behaviour is controlled, that instead of you earning, uh, instead of me taking out 11% super from your super, I now take out 15% or 20%. Mm -hmm. It's your money. Mm -hmm. I'm taking and putting it aside, Mm -hmm. but you can't spend it Mm because you don't have as much money. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the whole, uh, I've raised uh, as well a number of times, and uh, Ross actually mentioned this yesterday, but GST, GST could be increased temporarily from 10%, I don't know what the numbers are, but say 10% to 15%, Whilst ever we got to control people's behaviour, yep. as soon as our, our, in other words, as soon as inflation is under control, we wind yep. uh, GST back to ten percent. What I'm saying here is that perhaps it's time that the governments, both state and federal, got together and said, "Listen, this stamp duty is, st- is stupidity because it actually warps markets." Mm-hmm. So if New South Wales got stamp duty concessions in Victoria, doesn't everyone goes to buy in Victoria yeah. or yeah. in Queensland? I mean, it, it's it sort of creates stupid patterns that mm-hmm. don't really have any sense relative to demand and supply mm-hmm. in terms of rentals or whatever the case may be. So I just think it's time to have that conversation and uh, I think it all sits around the GST and the allocation process. Look, I don't know why we aren't having a discussion around that very point with GST. It is a great tool, a great lever. Uh, and we know that, you know, increasing interest rate, it's 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 a very blunt policy that they've got. It only affects a certain sector well, of the market. It affects two sectors. Yeah. It affects beneficially another sector. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And they actually spend yeah. more. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And then all of a sudden you're chasing your tail. Yeah, yeah. And we just going back to your GST, I do like that because you've also got, you know, you've got the baby boomers that are probably drawing down tax-free money from super and not getting impacted at all and interest rates go up so investments are going up. I'm not, you know, hitting just that one area but the, the spending there can be controlled if that GST is wound up a little and bit. And it's evenly yeah. shared. Yeah, it's evenly shared. Everybody. You want to go crazy and buy yourself a new yeah. outfit, new couches, new, that, go for it but pay for it. If you don't, then great, you're not being impacted. What so, do you think is the reason why these things and we'll have to wind up sooner? What do you think the, the reason is governments, and let's not pick on any one particular yeah, prime yeah. minister, but governments don't do this. I mean, it seems to be perfectly logical to me. But I'm then again not trying to get voted back in in 2025. Yeah. But yeah. What, what do you think the reason is? A lot of it is swayed by political vote and a lot of it is a lot easier just to tinker with what we've got than actually sit down and have a good plan and come up with something. Do you think they're scared of the media? Uh, do they think they're scared of the Look, the media's going to get them either which way, let's be real so here. So you're, you're in more, the media? More, well, more so, I think, where is the majority of voters and how is it going to work for them? So they're driven really by holding their position than actually improving the economy. But do you think, that, do you think like, you know, the current government would be mm. concerned that, um, you know, the Telegraph's going to get stuck into them because, you know, they've in, they said they won't increase taxes and they haven't, they'll increase, G, if they do what we just talked about, they increase the GST, say, to 15% for whatever. Yeah, the, yeah. But at the same time, the states have agreed to stop charging us stamp duty or payroll yeah. tax, whatever the case may be. Do you really think that people would um, 
buy that story if they're being criticised by one particular news outlet. I mean, you're not going to criticise. I mean, yeah, yeah. Intelli- smart, yeah. intelligent, sensible journalists are not going to say anything about it. They're going to say, well, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Because those other things are dumb. I, I, do, I don't think they're concerned about the media. I really don't. No. I think they're in the business of handling the media. Um, and the media is going to go whichever side anyway. They're still going to. whether they No matter what. No matter what. Yeah. I mean, that, that, uh, that sells too. That sells papers. That sells, you know, that, that, that gets us talking and so on. So do you think yep. it's then, I, I, I'm, then is perhaps the answer then I'm better off doing nothing? Yep. Because, I really do believe that, yeah. that I'm well, better off terrible. not rocking the boat or helping the the, the, the the sector that I think is going to keep me in my position and be seen to be doing something than actually doing something. So if you've been around a long time, we've known yeah. you for a long time and uh, you know, you're much younger than me, though. Substantially <laughs> you got that right, Mark. Substantially, oh, <laughs> substantially younger than me. But uh, do you sometimes feel a little bit let down when politicians or the politics, not politicians, but the politics control the policies more so these days than ever before? Back in the Keating days and the Bob Hawke days and the... John Howard days, they had no fear of introducing policy that was in the best mm. interests of Australians. Mm. And, mm. and as much as it was, uh, Cooney was criticised, you know, the compulsory superannuation was one of the greatest things that ever happened in this country in I terms agree. of I agree. You know, like making sure that the government's purse is not affected when we all retire mm-hmm. and that all of us are actually made to do something responsible about mm-hmm. our own retirement. I, mm-hmm. think it was, I think it was brilliant, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. I'm not sure about how strong the super funds have become and how whole they are to the unions, but that's, that's another a different story issue. altogether. Totally yeah. different issue. I'm all for for savings, so just put that on the Correct. record. And super is a for savings. Unfortunately, Aussies don't save unless they're forced. It's why we are so good at paying off debt. So if you can use that kind of psychology and put it to good, that's why I like super. So do you despair then? Um, we don't have this today. We and, and not just today. Previous the previous administration. We don't seem to have the same courage yep. in terms of economic policy in this nation to help us through problems um, like, like for the example, the problems we just talked about, stamp duty, the silliness of it and payroll yeah. tax, the silliness of us. Yeah. And we've got, right in front of us we've got a GST yeah. that, you know, John Howard introduced, it works, yeah. makes sense, people are used to it, uh, they're not going to blow up too much. Uh, do you despair at uh, the lack of courage? Is it absolutely? I, I think when you have so many intelligent people around and talking and communicating that the government does not pick up on this, it is disheartening. It's also disheartening that the people that need the most amount of help, what is common sense, what needs to be done, just doesn't get done. And unfortunately, it, 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 it's a case that. What will keep me in party? What are the strategies just over that term that work? There's no long-term vision. and It's the way the whole system is set up. Um, and unfortunately, you know, if you're planning and strategizing just for your term to get that through, we're never going to get ahead. And some common sense is seriously missing from our politicians. You know, it's, it's funny. You said right at the beginning, Paul mm. Clitheroe's mantra, save little and save a lot, basically by definition, fundamentally by the means of stop spending. Yeah, yeah. So if we introduced a higher GST and we had someone like Paul come out and just say that, people would immediately work out the behaviour that the governments need to see to mm-hmm. control inflation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in which inflation would fall at a far faster clip than mm-hmm. we've ever seen before. Yeah, yeah. Every, because everyone in the nation... Would take that option. Yeah, they would spend yeah. less. Yeah, and but and 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 I know, like in my own, my dad's case, who's you know nearly ninety. Um, in my dad's case, he's never earned so much money as he has in the last two years. Never in terms of interest on his deposit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And dad's not really spent spend through person, but he's like he's in his centenarian period, and uh, he's it equally doesn't want to have to take it with him, and uh, he's he's spending it. Yeah. Buying. Gifts for his grandkids, his great grandkids, his kids. Like you know, like yeah, I'm. He's going to spend his money. Um, and if that, but my dad come from, so he's one of the people who actually are pushing down on those mortgage holders so much so that by spending money so much so that those mortgage holders are going to have to pay higher interest rates or have had to pay higher interest rates mm-hmm. unfairly because of the spending habits of someone like my dad's generation or his cohort of people. Mm-hmm. But if my dad found out that 
hang on, everything's going to go up in price by 5% or, 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 or go up by 50% because of a 5% GST increase. Mm-hmm. Just, sorry, GST is going to go up by 50%. My dad coming from a certain type of personality, he said, oh, I'm not going to pay that. I'm yep. not going to spend the money. I'll yep. save it. Yep. And I'm going to keep saving it because I'm going to get a good interest rate anyway mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. the current environment. Mm. So it is truly the the – it's not the burden is truly shared because my dad's not actually going to spend. He, those people in that from that period of life, those people who were born in the 30s and 40s and 50s have gone through depressions and world wars and all sorts yeah. of things, and especially the migrants, they're not going to spend the dough. No, that's right. But you, I think you said an important point before that that it's a lever that goes up or goes down as needed. Yeah, yeah. Because let's not underestimate, we do still need people to spend. I mean, we've got, you know, businesses, we've got the economy, yeah, we've yeah. got to keep pushing through. Unfortunately, this is a cycle. that, that But you, you know, can play with it. You can play with it. That's the important thing to play with it. Rather than just rest everything. I mean, I, I've been around for a while, as you say, we're both but old. you've seen a few cycles. I've seen a few cycles. The fact that the burden was placed essentially on middle belt Australia, lower income, people that were told, go out, go borrow. The the RBA was giving cheap money. Go out, get these home loans. They did. And then what happens? 13 rate hikes, slap with that. Then, okay, it's all okay. We can go on mortgage pauses. Go on mortgage pauses. Well, uh, this was something I spoke about the other day on the Today Show. A mortgage pause is fine, but it's like sitting in a cab, stuck in traffic, watching that, that meter tick up. Because it adds up. up. It adds up. Your principal adds up. So I had one situation where a viewer was actually on a mortgage pause. She got a phone call when it ended. Hey, you owe us. The interest accrued now. Plus keep your mortgage repayments. Jack those back up again. How is this helping anyone? And how how did we get to a situation where we have put the whole burden on one group within the community? I just don't get it. I mean, I may not be as smart as the politicians. They're in that role, but... Just I'm did not, not yeah. I'm being sarcastic now, <laughs> Mark. I'm just not sure where we got, well, how we got to this situation. Just doesn't make sense. And, and I bet you, if you had a politician that did have some common sense, they would get people's votes and they would be in there. Well, we're going to finish off on this here because I won't keep it much longer. But I, I, it bothers me a little bit. I like to hear what you commented on it. Is a, also it bothers me a little bit that even the opposition's not talking about it. So it sort of indicates to me that both sides of politics are taking the view. Let's not rock the boat. Yeah, yeah. We just want to yeah, get voted back yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it seems like a bit of an oligopoly, doesn't it? We, so we have um, it's going to be either Senate you or me. inquiries into supermarkets, you know, doing price, price gouging. I mean, look at our parties. They're no better. Yeah, well, yeah. No, that, that bothers the hell out of me. And, uh, and I mean, I, you know, I'm not necessarily promoting Paul Keating or Bob mm. Hawke or John Howard for that matter or, or Malcolm Fraser, but they had massive conviction mm-hmm. and I, I just think the world's changed a lot yeah. but unfortunately it hasn't changed for the better and I'm looking for a party. My, the party that's going to get my vote is the one that goes out and makes these big calls and makes these big decisions. Yeah. It's not about having a talk fest and let's have another inquiry into the tax system and all that stuff. It's about making the calls. They know what calls Someone, to make. Yeah. They know the calls. And uh, like you know, you, Ross Gittins, like Ross is, uh, you know, he's on the left side of politics or towards the left side of politics. He's a smart economist. Yeah. When someone like him starts saying these things, someone, for God's sake, pay attention yeah. in, in politics because, you know, he's. I think he was spot on yeah. in his column yesterday. And uh, and by the way, by the time this gets to you, his yesterday would have been about three or four weeks ago. But <laughs> it doesn't know, matter. he's hard work. But, but have a look <laughs> him up. Uh, uh, Ross, you, you yeah. look, he, uh, look, look his stuff up and uh, it, it's very good. And uh, if he, um, once again, thanks. It's really good to talk to you about these sort of things because not often these sorts of conversations get aired. Yeah. Usually you and I are on television for about two minutes. Two minutes if we're lucky. And we, and we, and <laughs> Did we I ne- give you two minutes? Two Damn minutes. it. I'm gonna, Carl but, and Sarah, why do you give him two minutes? But they never ask me the questions <laughs> that are up there. They always end up asking some other question that's up on the screen. But, but like two minutes and radio is the same. You can't, there's not enough time for people like us to have a conversation like with some depth. And I think today's been a beauty. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks, thanks for allowing me to, to join your community. Love it. Thank you. Ta.